In this clip from the James Bond film, A View to a Kill, the villains played by Christopher Walken and Grace Jones are overlooking San Francisco. This is where our story will begin. Wow. What a view. In the summer of 2000, conspiracy theorist and radio talk show host Alex Jones snuck into a place very near to San Francisco called the Bohemian Grove. A few years after this momentous feat, I was asked by Alex to work for him. I was honored that he would ask, so I agreed. I no longer work for Alex, but I remember once while we were just talking, my mind drifted from the conversation, and I thought in awe, this is the guy who snuck into Bohemian Grove. What is Bohemian Grove? Let us look at, let's, let's look at Northern California. You understand? Yeah. You know what's happening San Francisco. San Francisco is just gone. It's clear so, over. I know that, but it isn't. It isn't just down in the rainy part of town. Now, but the upper class in San Francisco is that way. The Bohemian Grove that I attend on time to time. The Easterners and the others that come there. But it is the most faggy goddamn thing you will ever can ever imagine. The San Francisco crowd that goes in there. It's just terrible. I mean, I can't wash <laughs> What if I were to tell you that every year, America's most powerful men, politicians, CEOs, even presidents of the United States, gather at a secret retreat in Northern California to set the agenda for our nation? In 1878, the Bohemian Club held their first retreat at a place called The Grove. Over the years, the all-male, invitation-only retreat has included everyone from Walter Cronkite to Warren Buffett. I've heard all kinds of crazy stories about what happens at the Grove, from the origins of the Manhattan Project in 1942 to the determination of presidential candidates since 1900, even that the roots of the United Nations came out of talks at the Grove. But the members of the Bohemian Club simply do not talk about what goes on, so the speculation is endless. Only the members know what the truth is. But if you tell me that FDR, Eisenhower, Nixon, Reagan, Bush, and Clinton are all members of the same secret organization, I want to know what this group is all about. All of that changed on July 15th, 2000, when we ripped aside the veil of secrecy and were successfully able to penetrate the Bohemian Grove on their high holy day and videotape the cremation of care ritual. Our infiltration is chronicled in my documentary film, Dark Secrets Inside Bohemian Grove. A British documentary film company, World of Wonder, also covered our investigation. In the weeks that followed, Alex streamed his footage on his website and released it as a sell-through video. Everywhere I looked, the internet was aflame with news of the daring raid. As the news spread across the planet that the Bohemian Grove had been blown wide open and that their secrets were public, the people were amazed. And they're meeting annually in the California woods to discuss the future of our country. Not only that, but they're extremely vigilant about keeping outsiders away. People have tried for years to infiltrate this group with almost no success. So maybe it's just summer camp for rich people, but even if it is, why keep it so secret? The Bohemian Club was started in 1872 by a number of journalists. It was a club to get together after work and have a good time. Pretty soon thereafter, it started to change its character as it let in non-artists, just patrons. Patrons who had money, mm -hmm. and artists usually need money. Did they sort of take over and change the flavor of this thing? Let's take the motto of the club, weaving spiders come not here from Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. And that was originally the motto for an intent to not bring your business here. Weaving Bring spiders come not yeah. here. Yeah, don't come here and make deals and, and weave. The Grove is dominated by Republicans, the supposed party of Christian conservative family values. But the Grove has its share of high-powered Democrats as well. It's also important to note that the Grove itself was founded in 1872 by West Coast journalists, and that the National Press Club adopted the iconography of the Grove for its great seal. 
There are three major icons used in the cremation of care ritual. Moloch, the owl idol, the curved staff carried by the high priest, and the eternal flame lamp, the Arabian style lamp, which the priest uses to ignite his torch, which he then uses to burn the human effigy care. Here are video stills of the effigy after it has been burned on the altar in the morning. Many researchers of the global elite believe that real sacrifices are going on at the Grove. When I filmed the ceremony in 2000, I saw no evidence of this. It looked like an effigy, and the Druid priests were easily able to pick it up and take it up the steps to the platform. Thank you. Have you been there for the ceremony with uh, the cremation of care? Uh, frankly, that's, uh, that, uh, I don't think that's something I need to talk to you about. Really? That's right. Well, I'm Alex Jones, and I snuck in there in 2000. I'm the guy that blew it wide open and got the video. It's been on national TV. Well, I disrespect you for that. If you've never heard about the place, then I encourage you to look it up. I remember when I first saw Alex's footage that he brought back from California. He aired it immediately on Austin Cable Access. From that moment on, I could never look at things the same way. Some people will look at this information and dismiss it outright. I suppose I don't blame them. I think there is some truth to the saying, ignorance is bliss. But when you stop to think about it, these are guys who are in positions of power and they are performing some occult ritual. I think it behooves one to inquire further. In 2002, there was a film called Teddy Bear's Picnic. It is a parody of the Bohemian Grove. I know what you're thinking. I thought this show was supposed to be about Twin Peaks. It is, but I can't go into that without first laying some foundation. Here is a trailer for that film. And the Redwood country is bracing for yet another invasion of the Zambesians. Oh no, that's not a new kind of killer bee. It's the members of California's and maybe the country's most exclusive men's club. I hereby declare the Glen and all its bars open. So I take it we were all good boys last night? <laughs> I probably should fold up the nun's habit for you, right? Well, maybe not. I'll be back. Wow, this thing is like a howitzer. Looks like good makeup. You know, these days you never know when you're going to be on the news, so you wear it every day just as a precaution. Someone just walks out of here with a goddamn case of goddamn dick, for God's sakes. You people are killing me. You sent something in here unmarked. Have it fly without lights, for Christ's sakes. That's something we practice, isn't it? Have you ever used a video camera before? Yeah. Hey, you little prick! Give me that camera! Stop! You know who I am! all that you need to know right now. Now we'll watch a clip from the film. It is the assassination of time. Amazing news. Dateline, Zambezi Glen. Time was assassinated here this evening. Shortly after, we don't know when. Time, the slave driver who binds us to our worldly lives with silken cords of duty. Time has been banished to oblivion. <laughs> Ah, 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 ah. 
Once again, the great pelican has freed us of the shackles of time until we depart to resume the dreary burdens of power and privilege. Now the real event which the film is parodying is called the cremation of care. Here is actual footage, Alex Jones snuck out. I won't go much into my analysis of what is really meant in the dialogue of the cremation of care. I will save that for another show. Needless to say, the context of this ritual is sacrifice. These priests of the grove sacrifice something or someone called care. To students of history, the idea of priestly sacrifice is nothing new. Mark Frost, the co-creator of Twin Peaks, published a book called The Secret History of Twin Peaks. On the cover, as you can see, is the owl cave symbol and an owl. Apparently Frost has made the connection with Bohemian Grove also. The book is assembled in dossier form, and in one section there is a newspaper clipping of the Twin Peaks Post from May 9, 1983. Carl Rod, who is Harry Dean Stanton's character, writes, no, sir, I don't know if it's the Knights of Columbus, the Knights Templar, the Illuminati, or the Trilateral Commission. It don't matter. They're all the same bunch in different costumes anyway. Always have been. Ever wonder why the symbol of the Bohemian Grove is an owl? A big giant statue of one standing out in the woods like some ancient Sumerian deity? On the previous page, we have Agent Tamara Preston's footnotes, which specifically mention the cremation of care. The book also mentions Masonic lodges and even has a picture of a Masonic apron. There are even two full pages which feature an owl. This one, which is an illustration of an owl superimposed with the all-seeing eye. And this one, which is an actual photo of the Bohemian Grove owl. Incidentally, here are some other photos. A little note before we begin, I love Twin Peaks. I'm not telling anyone to go out and boycott the show or to do anything silly. I really want to be clear on this. I'm a TV and film fan, and David Lynch happens to be one of my favorite filmmakers. I believe the films he makes are an amazing sensory experience, and for the most part, if I may generalize, but I think most artists are very passionate human beings. I think artists really care about humanity and how we treat each other. So when I talk about David Lynch and Stanley Kubrick, 
I do so because it is my staunch conviction that these are two artists who care about people. It's an amazing topic to be sure. One thing I've always wondered, when drawing connections between films or looking at a piece of art, and contemplating some deeper hidden meaning that the artist did not mean to conceal entirely, but just enough to avoid detection. But here's what I think. I do not believe David Lynch or Mark Frost intended to write a television show about Bohemian Grove. While I think it is true that an artist creates from experience, I believe that David Lynch is a very unique type of artist who draws inspiration from that place in the beyond that fuels the mad visions we as mortals encounter in feverish delusions and in that moment of time between dreams and waking. The theory I am about to propose, namely that Twin Peaks is an allegorical tale of the exploitation of youth by well-to-do men with perverse passions as paralleled in the works of Kubrick, is that this happened unintentionally but has real-world implications in Bohemian Grove. Now there is a Kubrick reference in Twin Peaks, and it comes to us rather early in the series. In the third episode, Jerry Horn says, All work and no play makes Ben and Jerry dull boys. This is a paraphrasing of the classic line from Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. All work and no play make Ben and Jerry dull boys. That's right. Ben and Jerry are, of course, talking about going to One-Eyed Jack's, which is a brothel and casino located just across the border in Canada. What is interesting about this is that Stanley Kubrick was going to direct the film One-Eyed Jack's, which starred Marlon Brando. When Audrey asks Donna if she'd ever heard of One-Eyed Jack's, she replies, It gets better. You ever heard of One-Eyed Jack's? Isn't that the western with Marlon Brando? Another interesting note is there is a scene in One-Eyed Jack's when Agent Cooper is going to rescue Audrey, and we see that the place is full of red walls, red rooms, red rum. Red room, red room, over here. Red Red rum, red rum, red rum, red rum. That scene at One-Eyed Jack's, though, has more in common with Eyes Wide Shut and the orgy at Somerton. At this time, I want to point out that Kubrick's The Shining and Eyes Wide Shut are similar films. Kubrick had indicated to Michelle Cement in an interview for A Clockwork Orange that he intended to make the story by Schnitzler called Tromnovelle into a film. This is the story that Eyes Wide Shut is based on. So when Kubrick made The Shining, we know that initially he wanted to make what became Eyes Wide Shut. My belief is that Kubrick somehow became involved with the elite or people in positions of immense power in some capacity, perhaps as a filmmaker. And during this time, he was exposed to something that affected him in a disturbing way. This would explain why he left America and stayed in England for the rest of his life. It would also explain why he would never fly in an airplane, even though he had a pilot's license. Whatever it was that Kubrick saw, it affected him on a deep level. Matthew Modine the actor who played Joker in Full Metal Jacket kept a diary which chronicled his experience working with Kubrick on this film. There is one excerpt in particular which I find strangely revealing. I crawl into one of the holes and to my horror find a dead mother rabbit and her kits. They must have been killed when the palm was moved out of the hole. The baby rabbits couldn't have been more than a week old. What are you looking at? I look up and see Stanley looking down at me. It's a family of rabbits. They got crushed. Stanley doesn't have to crawl into the hole because he can see the mess from where he is. I get out of the hole and walk away, but Stanley remains at the hole for quite some time. I am sad for the rabbits, but Stanley seems profoundly upset, not the existentialist that people imagine. What did Kubrick see? I believe this can be answered by looking at his films, and there is a common thread which is revealed. These are not ordinary people. These are the best. Barry Lyndon expresses this also. When I take up a person, Mr. Lyndon, he or she he is safe. There is no question about them anymore. My friends are the best people. Oh, I don't mean that they're the most virtuous, uh, or indeed the least virtuous, or the cleverest, or the stupidest, or the richest, or the best born, but the best. A mother and her child sit and eat breakfast while cartoons are playing. 
The main location where the weird stuff occurs is at a big place, away from the city. There are news items which both deal with a tragedy involving a young woman. Family of three. The colors blue, gold, and red are prominent. There are two girls. Both have ballroom scenes with dancing and a live band. A scene involving a naked woman centered on the screen. Both characters awaken from a horrible dream. It's this line which is repeated, unusual. For a Kubrick film, this is suggestive that Kubrick saw something that freaked him out. Whatever he saw, I think it filled him with horror. The teddy bear. This mirror scene. Masks, sex, and the elite. I find it hard to look at these identical themes. In some cases, the scenes are framed exactly the same to see this and think it was a coincidence. No way, not with Stanley Kubrick. This is intentional. There are similar themes in Twin Peaks, and we'll go over more of them. But the main one I would like to point out now is the family of three. Leland, Sarah, and Laura Palmer mirror Jack, Wendy, and Danny Torrance. In this clip, notice the axe behind Sarah Palmer. Leland is like Jack Torrance, a man who has gone insane, yet has assistance from the supernatural and wants to kill his kid. Also, the hotel in Twin Peaks is named the Great Northern. It has four syllables like the Overlook. Both hotels have Native American motifs. Back to Kubrick for a second. Somehow Kubrick got involved with the elite, all the best people, and ended up with more than he bargained for. But what did he see? I think it had to do with the corruption of innocence. This makes perfect sense to me. In the film Lolita, the main character talks about weird friends in art movies that the character called Quill T wanted her to be in. To New Mexico. Whereabouts in New Mexico? To a dude ranch near Santa Fe. The only problem with it was he had such a bunch of weird friends staying there. What kind of weird friends? Weird. Painters, nudists, writers, weightlifters. But I figured I could take anything for a couple of weeks because I loved him and he was on his way to Hollywood to write one of those spectaculars. And he promised to get me a studio contract. But it never turned out that way. And instead, he wanted me to cooperate with the others making some kind of a, you know, an art movie. In a way, Laura Palmer and Lolita share much in common. In Lolita's room we see Innocence, a teddy bear. 2001 A Space Odyssey is actually a Masonic fantasy, and I actually have a video here on YouTube called 2001 A Masonic Odyssey. Please check that out on this YouTube channel. Oh, by the way, if you like what you've seen so far, like, share, and subscribe. I don't get any money from these videos, but your appreciation goes a long way. Thank you. In A Clockwork Orange, we see youth corrupted and undergoing mind control. In Barry Lyndon, the young child dies and a boy is disturbingly spanked. Incidentally, the film is a story about a guy who is not part of the elite, but tries to buy his way in. 
The original film Kubrick wanted to make was a film about Napoleon, which in a way is a similar idea of a guy who, not part of the elite, through his boldness of actions, puts himself in a position of being elite. In Full Metal Jacket, we also have the needless brutality of youth and corruption of innocence. Fire and death seem to be a recurring theme when one thinks of Full Metal Jacket, Twin Peaks, and the cremation of care. There is a scene at Stars and Stripes, and the room has multiple animated characters, very reminiscent of Danny Torrance's room. Notice they both have Snoopy and Disney characters. Joker is seen here, flanked by two Mickey Mouse figurines. And notice this flag of California. Then, at the end, surrounded by flames, the soldiers sing the theme of the Mickey Mouse Club. Mouse! Mickey Mouse! Mickey Mouse! Forever let us hold our banner high, 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 high! Boys and girls from far and near, you're welcome as can be. M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-C Two things I want to point out about Full Metal Jacket. At the end, when the soldiers are singing the Mickey Mouse Club theme, there is a structure to the right that always seemed a bit odd to me. Could it be a reference to the Owl of Bohemia? Then, shortly after, there are two structures that Kubrick aligns to form what appear to be two columns. Could this be a reference to the two columns of Freemasonry? There is also the number 33, which shows up in a previous scene. 33 is the highest degree one can earn as a Freemason in the Scottish Rite. Kubrick intended to make a film about Napoleon. The screenplay began and ended with a teddy bear. Here is the film Eyes Wide Shut. We have more teddy bears. What is with all the teddy bears? This scene with the teddy bears is actually at the end of the film. In a video with Michelle Cement, the interviewer most trusted by Kubrick, Cement says that it is at this toy store in the final scene where the daughter of Bill Harford is handed over to the same guys that were at the Christmas party. This is quite an observation. Here is a clip from Kubrick and the Illuminati. Blanc dans la dernière scène, quand vous la voyez dans le, dans le magasin de jouets, euh, c'est qu'il y a des symboles en fait partout de ce qu'on a vu euh, à Somerton. Vous voyez, il y a un jeu qui s'appelle The Magic Circle. Il euh, y a des pentacles, il y a des étoiles partout. Il euh, y a des ours en peluche partout. Et l'ours en peluche est un symbole de l'enfance maltraitée aux États-Unis. Et dans Shining, il y a des ours aussi. Euh, ça revient euh, très fréquemment. Euh, et vous voyez, la dernière fois qu'on voit la gamine, hein, Cruz et Kidman sont déjà en train de discuter en se demandant est-ce qu'on va rester ensemble, est-ce qu'on va euh, divorcer. Et on voit la petite qui leur jette un regard, comme ça, c'est la dernière fois qu'on la voit, elle s'éloigne dans les rayonnages du, du, du magasin. Et si vous regardez bien, mais alors là, je pousse un peu loin, hein, mais c'est dans le film, hein, on le voit. Il y a trois personnages qui carrément la, la prennent en, en sandwich. C'est-à-dire, vous voyez, il y a deux types qui sont en train de regarder des ours. Et il y a un mec avec des cheveux un peu longs. Et on reconnaît vraiment trois types qui sont à la soirée chez Sidney Pollack au début. Il y a un serveur qui a des cheveux longs. Et il y a deux types qui sont clairement vus en train de discuter, assis à une table au plein d'escalier, quand Cruz va, va monte voir, euh, voir Pollack euh, quand il le fait appeler euh, dans la salle de bain. Donc après, on peut se dire, tiens, Kubrick, c'est pas emmerdé. Il a repris des figurants... Euh... <rire> Mais ça paraît un peu bizarre qu'il ait repris des gens qui... Comme si tout d'un coup, Nicole Kidman détournait l'attention de son mari pour que sa fille soit peut-être kidnappée par trois équipes. In Eyes Wide Shut, we see a very young model being exploited by the rich and powerful character played by Sidney Pollock named Ziegler. Then there is this young girl who is pimped out by her father. The film that Kubrick wanted to make when he died was AI Artificial Intelligence, which was eventually made by Steven Spielberg. This movie is the sad story of a young robot boy. And who is the youth's companion throughout the film? You guessed it, a teddy bear. What is interesting about AI is that it has many Pinocchio references. In Disney's Pinocchio, the main character, a young puppet who wants to be a boy, is sold not once but twice for the enslavement of wicked men. In the second half of the film, Pinocchio, along with many other boys, are taken to a place called Pleasure Island. I've got to be honest, I watch a lot of videos and I hate it when people make connections that aren't there, but this stuff you can't make up. The connections are clearly there, too many to be a coincidence, and there are more, but I've got to stay within the context of Twin Peaks here. 
So let's continue. In episode Rest in Pain, we are introduced to a secret society, the Bookhouse Boys. But this one is good, one that I wouldn't mind being a member of, but this is what they say about the forest. Twin Peaks is different, a long way from the world. You've noticed that. Yes, I have. That's exactly the way we like it. But there's a, a back end to that that's kind of different, too. Maybe that's the price we pay for all the good things. What would that be? There's a sort of evil out there. Something very, very strange in these old woods. Call it what you want, uh, a darkness, a presence. It takes many forms, but it's been out there for as long as anyone can remember. And we've always been here to fight it. We? Men before us, men before them. More after we're gone. A secret society. In the episode The Orchid's Curse, Judge Sternwood says, The woods are wondrous but strange. You keep your eye on the woods. The woods are wondrous here. But strange. What is so dark about the forest? In one episode, Donna and James are in the woods. And in a moment of intimacy, they are alarmed by an owl. <coughs> After this scene, we cut to the mounted head of a mountain goat. Is there a connection between an owl and a goat? One could say this is a reference to the goat of Mendes. In the film, the witch, the goat, is the devil. In Rosemary's Baby, the devil is an animal, presumably a goat. This is no dream. This is really happening. In the famous picture by Eliphas Levi, the devil is also a goat. Also interesting, the last picture in The Shining shows Jack Torrance in the Bay Fome pose. So to me, going from owl to goat is interesting. In Bohemian Grove, we have an owl. But if you look at this owl, it looks sinister, and it appears to have horns. In the cartoon Lucy Daughter of the Devil, which appeared on Cartoon Network, they don't try to hide it. The owl statue is the devil. Millions, worship me. Kneel before me. have announced their candidacy in front of this unholy altar. We celebrate the quest for power. We desecrate this ground with blood and fire. And in the most recent episode of season three, episode 14 of Twin Peaks had Sheriff Truman, Hawk, Andy, and Bobby Briggs go to Jack Rabbit's palace. It looked a little like the Owl of Bohemia. In the episode, May the Giant Be With You, the giant says, the owls are not what they seem. The owls are not what they seem. The show makes no attempt to explain what that means. And to be honest, I don't think it was ever meant by the writers to mean anything but to seem interesting. Honestly, it's hard to say. The show itself is brilliant. I wonder which parts were intended to have a deeper meaning and which just happened and the creators let things move organically and proceeded from there, and meaning happened as a result. The Log Lady mentions the owls, and Major Briggs also mirrors the giant by showing Cooper a printout which reads, The owls are not what they seem. What kind of cookies? Sugar. The owls won't see us in here. The readout took us by surprise. Row after row of gibberish, and all of a sudden, the owls are not what they seem.
for Miss Audrey Horn, please. Owls. Because according to my theory, it's about the Bohemian Grove Owl. But like I said, this was not intended by the creators. We do know that the Owl and Bob are seen together. There are owls all over this show. An obvious interpretation is that every time you see an owl, it is a warning of supernatural mischief. Even so, the show never explains what is meant by the owls are not what they seem. In the South Park season 14 episode 10 called In Sheepshin, there is an owl in San Francisco and it molests a very young Mackie. In the episode, Mackie has repressed the actions of the owl, so in his mind, the owl is not what it seems. Once he is under a dream regression, the truth comes out. Woody, okay? Don't touch my pee-pee. No, Woody, please, I'll give a hoot. <laughs> Again, let me point out that Mark Frost, one of the co-creators of Twin Peaks himself, put in the book, The Secret History of Twin Peaks, a photo of the Bohemian Grove Owl. In the book by Mark Frost, Carl Rod and the Log Lady disappeared while on a school nature walk, only to turn up a day later. This is just like the Major Briggs disappearance. Cooper hears an owl and then the Major is gone for a few days. When he reappears, he tells his story. Cooper. Do you remember anything else? Very little, save for one disturbing image of a giant owl. A giant owl. A giant owl. How big? Enough to cloud my mind and memory. There was a giant owl. What ties all this together is missing people, the woods and owls. We take a bit of a turn for the dark now, but Twin Peaks is not known for shying away from the dark. In 2014, a documentary called Who Took Johnny examines an infamous 30-year-old cold case, the disappearance of Iowa paperboy Johnny Gosh, the first missing child to appear on a milk carton. The film focuses on the heartbreaking story of Johnny's mother, Noreen, and her relentless quest for the truth about what happened on the tragic September morning in Des Moines when Johnny never returned from his paper route. Along the way, there have been mysterious sightings, strange clues, bizarre revelations, and a confrontation with a person who claims to have helped abduct Johnny. Steeped in intrigue and conspiracy theories, Who Took Johnny explores eyewitness accounts, compelling evidence, and emotional discoveries spanning three decades of the most spellbinding missing persons case in U.S. history. I wanted to show some clips from the film, but YouTube will not allow me to play them. If you can find the film, I recommend you watch it. I watched it on Netflix, believe it or not, but that was back when Stranger Things Season 1 had just come out. Here is where it gets interesting. In 1993, a film crew from Yorkshire Television in the UK went to Omaha, Nebraska to make a documentary about an alleged pedophile ring. The film was funded by the Discovery Channel and was originally to be shown in the UK as part of a series called First Tuesday. In Omaha, the Yorkshire TV crew discovered the machinations of a vast child trafficking network that provided children to the wealthy and political establishment for molestation and blackmail. Shortly before Conspiracy of Silence was to be screened on First Tuesday, the Discovery Channel inexplicably withdrew its support for the film, and to this day the documentary remains unaired. However, an unpolished rough cut of the documentary was saved. You can find it on YouTube. I first saw the documentary when Alex Jones aired it on Austin Public Access TV. I was shocked. Here is where it gets interesting. The documentary uses the music from Twin Peaks from start to finish, specifically Laura Palmer's theme. Paul Bonassi has come too. Larry King threw child sex parties at his $5,000 a month Washington house. Paul Bonassi was one of the victims.
Larry King's house down in Washington D.C. was it was a it was a nice house. It was on what they I guess I believe it was Embassy Row because that's what they kept uh, talking about. There were a lot of flags from different countries when you drove around in the area. So tell me, Paul, how often did you come? This is the true story of Lawrence King. It is the story of an evil at the heart of America, of a cover-up at the highest level. The documentary tells the story of Johnny Gosh, but it was made 20 years earlier than Who Took Johnny. Another possible link between Twin Peaks and the story of Gosh is with Leland Palmer. In one scene at the Great Northern, the song Home on the Range is being played. Leland Palmer likes old songs. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Shaw. Thank you. Good evening. A couple of belts, and even you might start to look good to me. Incidentally, old songs like this are all over the soundtrack for Eyes Wide Shut. Wynda Merrill also sings this same song later in the series. A discouraging word. Hello, Wilbur! There is the line, Where the Buffalo Roam. Could this be a reference to Hunter S. Thompson? There was a biographical film made which starred Bill Murray as Hunter Thompson. There was an MSNBC program which speculated that Johnny Gosh was really Jeff Gannon, a White House reporter during the W. Bush years with spurious credentials. It turned out that Gannon was formerly a gay escort, and as these pictures suggest, had a bizarre familiarity with the then president. Here is a clip from that MSNBC news segment, which cuts off as soon as Hunter S. Thompson is mentioned in connection with the Omaha, Nebraska case. Bloggers play detective, some claiming a fake White House reporter and a missing boy possibly sold into the sex trade are one and the same. Well, Hunter Thompson, uh, that came about because in a, a, a federal case that was, was in Omaha, Nebraska, one of the, one of the children that was uh, taken, right. and, and Noreen will confirm we're this. Gonna, we're going to ask our guests to stick around. Now, coming up, next we'll be joined by a private... Here are some things to note about Hunter S. Thompson. When Thompson died, his editorial assistant wrote a postcard which said, Another time he threw me out of the house for refusing to watch a snuff film. In Hey Rube, Hunter S. Thompson writes, There is always a rash of kidnapping and abductions of school children in the football months. Preteens of both sexes are traditionally seized and grabbed off the streets by gangs of organized perverts. This from the film Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which reproduces two parts in the book. In this clip, he is talking about exploiting a young girl, although in the book, the meaning is more clear. The film seems to fudge the language to force an ambiguity, but leaning more towards a defense on the part of Hunter S. Thompson. Well, what are your plans? Plans? The child in the bedroom. Oh, Lucy. I met her on the plane. Yeah. She's a religious freak. I give her a cab before I realize, Jesus, she's never even had a drink. Well, it'll probably work out. We can keep her loaded and then uh, pedal her ass at the drug convention. Yeah, she's perfect for this kid. These cops will go 50 bucks ahead to beat her into submission and then gang fuck her. We can set her up in one of these backstreet motels, hang pictures of Jesus all over the room, and then turn these fucking pigs loose on her. Well, she's strong, man. She'll hold her own. Jesus Christ, I knew you were sick, but I never expected to hear you actually say that kind of stuff, you filthy bastard. Straight economics, man. This girl's a godsend. Shut She can make us a grand a day. In this second clip, it is about a drug extracted from a living body, but also mentions the exploitation of youth. As your attorney, I advise you to take a hit out of the little brown bottle in my shaving kit. You won't need much. Just a tiny taste. What's that? Ah, there it is. Makes pure mescaline seem like ginger beer, man. Adrenochrome. Adrenochrome? Hmm. Where'd you get this? Never mind, it's absolutely pure. What kind of monster client have you hooked up with this time? 
Satanism freak. I think there's only one source for this stuff. The uh, adrenaline gland from a living human body. I know. The guy didn't have any cash to pay me. He offered me human blood, said it would take me higher than I'd ever been in my life. Well, he was kidding. Oh, so I told him I'd just as soon have an ounce of so pure adrenochrome. Or maybe just a fresh adrenaline gland to chew on. Thought. Yes, sir. They nailed this guy for child molesting. He swore he didn't do it. Why should I fuck with children, he said. They're too small. Christ, what could I say? Even a goddamn werewolf is entitled to legal counsel. Didn't dare to turn a creep down. All this reminds me of that news program which is playing about a missing woman while Wendy is in the kitchen of the Overlook. Also, it gives one pause to rethink what could be meant by the poster for The Shining, a grainy image of a child as if seen from an older TV, there was another poster which was drawn up which has a similar tone. At one point, Audrey is being held hostage at One-Eyed Jack's and she is filmed, shown on a grainy TV. That's good, Henry. She's ready for her close-up now. Laura Palmer was also tied up and filmed. Blood. In another David Lynch work, Lost Highway, there is also the doppelganger motif which occurs. There are two women, but yet they are the same. One is named Alice, the other Renee. This woman is forced to strip in one scene and is involved in porn. Ben Horn, the richest character in Twin Peaks, is a sex fiend. At one point, he even comes close to having sex with his own daughter. Notice the cat mask. One is reminded of the Playgirl magazine, which Jack Torrance is reading in the lobby of The Overlook, which has an article about incest. There is this connection with Twin Peaks, corruption of the innocence of youth by well-to-do perverts. An interesting subplot is when Andy and Dick Tremaine are trying to do the good thing with a child from an orphanage named Nikki, but they come up with this idea that he is the devil. What problem? It's our mutual friend, little Nikki. Yes? How should I prove this? Well, he's... He's... Andy, I believe that little Nikki, incredible as it may seem, may in fact be the devil. The devil? at the very least homicidal in the first degree. Andy, we got to find out what happened to his parents. At one point, they even tell a couple about to adopt that the child they've come for is dead. Nick. Hi. Where are the Brustons? 
Uh, I know we're a little early. Eh? It's just that we're so darn eager to see him. Can we see him? Where is Donnie? Uh, d d little Donnie is d dead. Hey, dead tired. I mean, I. I'm afraid little Donnie, he isn't feeling up to snuff. Well, he was in perfect health only yesterday. The cremation of care ceremony is a symbolic ritual intended to rid oneself of worldly worries. It involves influential and affluent individuals seeking a respite from their burdens. In this ritual, they attempt to sacrifice their worldly cares. To put it succinctly, the ceremonial priests try to extinguish care using earthly fire, but this proves ineffective. Consequently, they call upon the power of an owl for assistance. The owl, symbolizing wisdom and knowledge, acknowledges the limitation of earthly means and offers its own mystical fire for the task. This act suggests that transcending worldly concerns might require a force beyond the natural, possibly a supernatural one. The ritual implies that to truly let go of these earthly cares, a more extraordinary, otherworldly intervention is needed. This notion of a paradigm shift, where the usual methods are inadequate, and something more profound is necessary, echoes a sentiment similar to Major Briggs's reference to the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. It also mirrors the dynamics at play within the grove where traditional approaches are set aside for more esoteric or mystical solutions. Still I recognize the signs. What do the signs mean? There's a time. If Jupiter and Saturn meet in one episode, the mayor refers to a bohemian. My God, this, this guy is a British or, or bohemian or something. Going back to the Twin Peaks story with Nikki, the kid from the orphanage, Andy and Dick thought he might be the devil. Here we have the innocent youth seen as the enemy. And note that he is from an orphanage. The documentary Conspiracy of Silence was investigating the Boys Town organization, which is an orphanage. And what would Andy and Dick done if Nicky were the devil? The logical conclusion is that they would have to get rid of him. Is it a coincidence that Danny Torrance has these knives above him in The Shining? What in the world is going on in this old photo from Bohemian Grove? And the phrase, fire walk with me? Is that a reference to the cremation of care? Couldn't you make a morbid joke that a burning sacrifice is like a fire walk? Here is a clip from the film Fantasia, where the event presented seems to be an artistic rendering of what an animated, pun intended, sacrifice might look like. When you consider that the fire in the cremation of care ritual is from a supernatural dimension, it reminds one of the white and black lodges. Entrance to the lodge is located at Glastonbury Grove. Glastonbury Grove? It's a very interesting choice for a name. Glastonbury itself is the legendary burial place of King Arthur and Guinevere. When Agent Cooper goes to Glastonbury Grove, one scene frames him between two trees like the two pillars of masonry. There is even an owl there. It is here he will enter the lodge. Glastonbury Grove always reminded me of C.S. Lewis's book, The Magician's Nephew, In the Wood Between Worlds. There are pools that function as teleportation devices. That is exactly what Glastonbury Grove is, the wood between worlds. But there is a black lodge and a white lodge. It reminds me of the black and white tiles on the floor of a Masonic temple. One other oddity. When the group goes to the owl cave, they hear an owl screeching out. By the way, here you can see the symbol of the Owl Cave, which is on a stick. 
notice that it is connected to a symbol for fire. Then, when in one episode, they look at the chalkboard and see a hooded figure, why? The hooded figure shows up again in the following episode. They never explain the hooded figure. It seems to me to be a metaphor for a guide, an intermediary between the regular world and the White Lodge. But doesn't that explain what the function of a priest is? Isn't that the role of the priest at the Bohemian Grove? In a scene from the episode Slaves and Masters, Wyndham Earl leaves a message for Audrey. He mentions an owl. Owls! Apparently Earl dropped off a mask in Agent Cooper's room. I believe this scene was copied by Kubrick in Eyes Wide Shut. Stanley Kubrick was a David Lynch fan. He would make the cast and crew of The Shining watch a racer head. And the last scene of The Shining Jack Torrance sings, San Francisco, here I come, right back where I started from. But the actual lyric is, California, here I come. Why did Kubrick switch it to San Francisco? Now you might think I might just be hearing things, but the closed caption on the DVD for The Shining actually has San Francisco in the text during this scene. Remember the trailer and clip I showed at the beginning of this video of the film Teddy Bear's Picnic? Well, it's originally a song. This clip with lyrics to sing along are rather telling, aren't they? Beneath the trees where nobody sees, they'll hide and seek as long as they please, cause that's the way the teddy bears have the picnic. The whole Who Killed Laura Palmer arc is wrapped up in the episode Arbitrary Law. I lived in these old woods most of my life. I've seen some strange things, but this is way off the map. I'm having a hard time believing. Harry, is it easier to believe a man would rape and murder his own daughter? Any more comforting? No. An evil that great in this beautiful world. Finally, does it matter what the cause? Yes, because it's our job to stop it. Maybe that's all Bob is. The evil that men do. Maybe it doesn't matter what we call it. Maybe not. But if he was real, if he was here, and we had him trapped, and he got away, where's Bob now? The owl ends the episode.